Hey folks, today I'll be continuing my series on the classics. I apologize a bit for the delay. I was moving into a new office slash uh, recording space, so no more blue screen for me. Uh, but today we'll be continuing with the first great Russian chess master, Mikhail Shigorin. Uh, now we haven't covered any Russian players so far in this series, uh, but as we probably know, the Soviet Union was really dominant in the 20th century in chess, and Shigorin was kind of the, the father of that and, and the, the start of the so-called Soviet chess school. Shigorin was born in 1850, and he was basically considered the last great player of the Romantic era, where it was all about attack and sacrifice, as we've seen uh, throughout this series. He had a very original and unorthodox style. I would say he was a very concrete player who didn't really believe in so-called chess principles, but rather would focus on the details of the position and try to figure out the strongest continuation with what was actually taking place on the board. Shigorin has a couple of openings named after him. Uh, the famous one is, of course, the Shigorin defense that takes place after d4, d5, c4, and now this move knight to c6, which breaks some classical principles already, as it seems like black is not interested in fighting for the center with his pawns, but rather with his pieces, and Shigorin had some success with this opening. Uh, and he also has a very popular line of the Rui Lopez named after him uh, in this position. That comes from the Rui and is considered uh, one of the absolute main lines. Uh, here, most players are taught as black to play knight a5, bishop c2, and c5 in order to fight for the center. And now after d4, the move queen to c7, this one is known as the Shigorn variation of the Rui Lopez, which continues to be one of the most popular ways for black uh, to play this position. So like I mentioned, Shigorn had a very original style that focused on attack and the initiative. And in our first example here against the player uh, Emmanuel Schiffers, here Shigorin is playing white. And instead of playing a, let's say, normal move like castling, uh, Shigorin starts a really, really interesting plan, starting with the move knight to e2. Uh, black now castles kingside, which is absolutely natural. And here comes white's big idea, g4. And his point is just to initiate a, an attack on the kingside, pushing his pawns. His knight is headed to g3, and then hopefully to the f5 square where it will be a really strong attacking piece. Uh, black played queen d7, white played bishop e3, uh, and now black throws in bishop b4 check. And now white could absolutely play the move c3 here and just kick the bishop away, but this would leave the d3 pawn weak and after the bishop moved back, let's say bishop to a5, White could definitely castle queenside here and just defend this weakness with the rook. And I think white would actually have quite a nice position with good control over the center and the kingside pawn storm just getting started. But Shigorin takes things a little bit differently. Instead, he plays the move king to f1, which seems strange, but his point is that he wants to keep his structure intact. He doesn't want the d3 pawn to be a weakness, and he simply wants to keep his king uh, on f1 where it will be safe and not give black this target on the queen side to try and uh, seek counterplay against. The game continued rook a d8, knight g3, queen e6, and now h4. White starts pushing on the king side, a5. Uh, I'm not sure what this move is about. I think black is trying to get counterplay on the queen side, but it is very, very slow. Rook to g1, setting up for knight f5 in the near future. Black played king h8, knight to f5. Black goes g6. Here white first kicks the bishop with a3, and then after bishop d6, Shigorin simply leaves the knight on f5 and plays the move king to e2. Uh, a very strong sacrifice, and I would say a very modern sacrifice as well. Uh, this one I would say is considered thematic by today's players, where the knight is simply left on f5, and the idea is that if black captures the knight, which he does in this game, white plays g takes f5, of course opens up the g file for his attack, and basically makes it very difficult for black's pieces to really defend on the king side here, with white kind of controlling all of this space and white's pieces having better access. Uh, and here white's attack proved to be too strong. After queen d7, bishop h6 was the follow-up, forcing the move rook to g8, and now after bishop to g5, because of the threat of bishop f6 check, which is pretty devastating, black is forced to give back some material with rook takes g5, and now after hg, white has a rook for two minor pieces, but a ready-made attack on the h-file with rook h1 and queen h5 coming, and Shigorin was able to, to win this game uh, in style. If you want to check out uh, the full game here, I 
we'll be leaving a link in the description to the Lee Chess Study, where you can see the rest of this game as well as all of the games covered in the video and in the series, as well as some bonus games that don't make it into the video, so make sure to check the, the study out. Um, the next example comes from Shigorin's game against uh, William Pollock. And uh, here he makes a really interesting decision that I think was really kind of indicative of his style. Uh, here in this position, playing white, uh, I believe this came from uh, an Evans Gambit, which uh, Shigorin was quite fond of. So white is down a pawn, but has this kind of long-term initiative, especially uh, with black's king never really finding safety. Uh, and here Shigorin decides to play the move bishop to e3 which at first glance looks uh, positionally quite bad because it does allow black to take the bishop on e3 and force white to double his pawns. But the point after bishop takes e3, f takes e3, is that not only is white hitting the c7 pawn, which must be defended, but after something like rook c8, we can see white's second thread in the position, which only opens up because the rook on the f-file is now open, and that is the move e5, which of course wasn't possible before. Now white would be threatening e6, and if black goes d takes e5, then white has d6 check, where black is simply losing a piece on the spot. As bishop e6, this runs into either knight takes e5 check or knight g5 check, both just winning on the spot for white. Uh, so a very nice decision, I think, again, really illustrative of his style, where he does, didn't really care about the double pawns, it was all about the concrete tactics of the position and maximizing the activity of his pieces. After knight to g6, bishop takes b6, black is forced to play cb because the pawn was unprotected, and now after queen b4, white sets its, his sights on the d6 pawn, queen e7, knight g3, rook fc8, knight to d4, and white was basically able to dominate the position, soon pushing f4, landing the knight on e6, and uh, eventually Shigorin was able to win this game as well. So Shigorin quickly became one of the strongest players in the world in the late 1880s, and would end up challenging Steinitz to a world championship match in 1892. Uh, however, before that happened, in 1890, he and Steinitz actually played a match uh, via telegraph, where both players received 48 hours per move, along with some delays if they wanted more time to analyze the position, so it was basically a correspondence game. Uh, and it was actually a themed uh, match where they decided on the positions that they would play out of the opening uh, before the match started. Uh, it ended up being only a two-game match, and Shigorin actually won both games, uh, defeating Steinitz uh, both times. The first game where he was playing white, uh, they agreed to play in Evans Gambit, and I believe the starting position of the game that they agreed to was this position after Castles and Queen F6, this move that uh, Steinitz kind of championed. Now objectively, by today's standards, this move is considered uh, quite dubious. It's better for Black to simply develop the knight with knight to F6, uh, but okay, Steinitz had a lot of his own ideas on the opening and especially how to defend with Black, whereas Shigorin really believed in White's initiative and was a huge proponent of, of the Evans Gambit. So here he plays D4, Black goes knight h6, bishop g5, queen d6, and now white pushes d5 and forcing this knight uh, backwards. Uh, Steinitz decides to drop the knight on d8. Uh, on e7, the knight would potentially be in the queen's way. And in fact, Steinitz was a player who really didn't mind putting his pieces uh, on the back rank, but as a result, he often got punished for it. Uh, and here, the way Shigorin develops the initiative, I think, was really nice. He starts with queen a4, hitting the bishop. Bishop went to b6, knight a3. Uh, black played c6 here, just trying to fight back against white center and, and get some counterplay. And here comes a really fantastic move, bishop to e2. Simply opening up the square for white's knight to come to c4 and really start putting a lot of pressure against black's position. Steinitz starts backing up, bishop c7, knight c4, queen f8. So another piece goes to the back rank, but black simply didn't have a ton of space in the position, so what to do? Uh, and now white doesn't worry about capturing uh, the pawn on e5, but rather goes d6, which is much, much stronger. Uh, now the point, as we'll see in the game, is that after bishop takes d6, white has this move knight to b6, taking advantage of the pinned rook on a8, or I should say the hanging rook. Instead, had black played bishop to b8, this would simply be way too passive, and after a move like bishop to e7, black's position would just be completely uh, awful. So. Black is forced to take the pawn, knight b6 comes, rook to b8, 
now queen takes a7 and once again black's position is uh, quite passive here bishop on c8 can't get out obviously the king is stuck in the center as well and uh, Shigorn uh, is able to find just a really nice way of conducting the attack uh, Steinitz tried knight to e6 here and uh, now comes another fantastic and very un unobvious idea bishop to c1 dropping the bishop all the way back but with the point that white now wants to play bishop a3 deflecting black's bishop on d6 away from the rook on b8 and since this bishop is going to be pinned to the queen black has a hard time of getting out of this for instance if bishop c7 white would just play bishop a3 and after d6 uh, among other things white could grab the pawn on e5 and just have a crushing position instead black played knight to g8 trying to get this knight back into the defense now bishop a3 comes c5 and this is a big concession for black to make, giving up the d5 square. White immediately starts pounding on the d-file with rook ad1, knight f6, bishop c4, bishop c7, and knight d5. Uh, bishop came back to d6, and now another strong maneuver, knight h4. And I feel like Shigorin really had a great feeling for maneuvers, especially knight maneuvers, and he often, uh, I believe, preferred knights uh, to bishops in certain types of positions. Uh, which again kind of showed his uh, concrete nature where depending on the situation he would either prefer the knight to the bishop whereas most players tend to prefer the bishops overall. Here black play knight takes d5 uh, instead of recapturing immediately he starts with knight f5 uh, taking advantage of the fact that if the knight moves from d5 then white will take on d6 with check and then of course grab this hanging rook on b8. Uh, black instead plays g6 and then after knight takes d6, queen takes d6, bishop takes d5, queen c7, uh, white more or less just uh, got a very simple and winning position here after bishop takes e6, fe, bishop takes c5, uh, with threats of bishop d6, bishop b6, and black was already just in a losing position, uh, losing material in the very near future. Uh, so Shigorin ended up uh, winning this game and would then uh, challenge Steinitz uh, in a world championship match, official match, in 1892. And he was doing quite well in this match. In fact, uh, here we have the first game of the match, uh, which is considered one of Shigorin's most uh, famous victories. Uh, again, this came from an Evans Gambit. This would be a, a constant point of discussion between the two players they had a ton of games in the Evans Gambit with Steinitz often trying to defend the black side taking on some very passive stodgy positions that I think really favored uh, Shigorin and his kind of natural attacking style. Um, here once again he starts with the move knight to a3 uh, trying to get the knight to c4 uh, better than the move knight d2 which would at least give black an option to trade off for this powerful knight so instead he goes via a3 then after knight h6, knight c4, bishop b6, he continues the attack with a4, threatening to trap the bishop with a5 and forcing black to make some kind of concession. Now if black pushes the a-pawn with a6 or a5, well then white would probably capture the bishop on b6, and after cb, once again black would be left with a lot of weaknesses in the position, and white would just have a ton of compensation. Instead, Steinitz decides to play the move c6, which feels more natural to give the bishop an escape square to c7, but again, it weakens the d6 square, and white immediately takes advantage of that with the move e5, simply fighting for the d6 square, and if d takes e5, white can take with the f knight perhaps, and is starting to get a ton of activity. So black pushed d5, the knight came into d6 with check, king to f8, now bishop a3, lining the king up, the bishop up against black's king. King g8 was played, rook to b1, just calmly improving the pieces and, and getting ready to look for some kind of sacrificial blow, which comes very quickly. Here black played the move knight hf5, trying to challenge uh, white's knight on d6. And here Shigorin uncorks a very famous and very spectacular combination. I would really encourage you guys to keep this one uh, in your memory. Uh, knight takes f7. King takes f7 is absolutely forced, and now white's point is to go e6 check. So queen takes e6, runs into knight g5, which would win the queen, and black is instead forced to take with the king. 
Now white doesn't have any immediate mates or immediate attack, but he does play the move knight to e5, hitting the queen, and now after queen c8, rook to e1. This is kind of the attacking position that white was aiming for. The king is cut off from reaching safety, he's now stuck in the center, and of course with white's last move, he's threatening a potential discovered attack against the king, which would win a ton of material. Black is forced to play king to f6, but after queen h5, white's attack is in full steam here. Uh, basically all of the pieces are included. The threat is to play queen to f7 check, among other things, and force the king up the board. Black tried g6, and now white had a number of strong opportunities here. I think the move knight g4 check was leading to a direct win. Um, the move Shigorin chooses, I think, is just as good. Bishop takes e7 check. Uh, if king takes e7, then knight takes g6 would follow double check, and white picks up a bunch of material. Um, this is what ends up happening in the game, as after knight takes e7, white would have the move queen h4 check, hitting the knight on e7, and if black wants to keep defending the knight, would have to play king e6, and again walk into uh, this discovered attack, whereas the move g5 here would run into knight g4 check, uh, among other things, queen h6 also looking pretty strong. Uh, so instead, black played king takes e7, just trying to survive, but now after knight takes g6, uh, white is able to win back uh, a ton of material, and black's king is of course still in huge danger. The game finished here after bishop takes d4, rook b3, queen d7, rook f3. Uh, black picks up the knight on h8, but white has g4, is winning back the piece, and is going to be uh, up in exchange, but again, uh, continuing the attack against Black's king, and Black is basically just lost here. Uh, the game finished with a nice little trick after rook to g8. White played queen h6 check. Of course, the knight is pinned and can't take on h6. Rook g6, uh, and now rook takes f5 uh, check. And here, Black resigned, because after the move queen takes f5, at first it seems like white has just totally blundered as the pawn is pinned and can't take and also white's queen is hanging, but white does have the move queen f8 check, uh, winning the queen with tempo and of course black's king is just going to get mated shortly after that. Uh, so this was a really brilliant game, I, I think this is one of uh, my favorite combinations of all time, and although Shigorin played extremely well in his match, a lot of people believe he deserved to win the world championship uh, against Steinitz. Uh, ultimately, he ended up losing the match. He kind of lost steam towards the end and uh, blundered in a very famous final game. Uh, he ended up blundering a mate in a winning position, uh, which allowed Steinitz to retain his title for a little bit longer. Uh, this match was actually quite interesting uh, from a chess point of view because uh, Steinitz was the older player, Shigorin was younger, and uh, but Steinitz represented the newer, modern, more positional school of chess, whereas Shigorin represented the older Romantic era. Uh, and it was this very interesting clash of styles where it was the older guy who was kind of representing the new school of chess and the younger guy representing uh, the old school of chess, which I've always found uh, a little bit uh, fascinating. Uh, unfortunately, Shigorin was not able to win the match, but will definitely go down as one of the greatest non-world champions uh, of all time. All right, guys, that wraps it up for this video. Once again, if you enjoyed it, please do leave a like on the video. It really helps the channel out. And if you want to check out this game as well as the other games and a couple of games not featured in the videos at all, do make sure to check out the link in the Lee Chess study in the description below. Hope you guys have a good day, and I'll see you next time. Take care.